What's going on, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to the More We Know podcast. This podcast is for you guys. The reason it's called The More We Know, it's because it's all about learning more and getting more information. So today we got Renji Bajoy, who's the CEO of Immerse, which is virtual reality, and he's gonna tell you a lot more about it. But it's really cool, guys. Literally, what you're able to do with Immerse is software that you can be in a virtual reality offices with your coworkers, your colleagues, consultants, whatever. It is super cool. We talked about the future of VR, maybe even things like long-term down the line. Can you taste, sense, feel food stuff, you know, in, in VR, there's so many cool things about virtual reality and Renji is a really smart man. So they have a campaign on WeFunder. They raised over a million bucks in one hour. The company overall has raised a lot more, but over a million bucks in an hour, guys. So take the time, listen to this hour podcast. It is literally a gem. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe on Apple, on YouTube, on Spotify, wherever, guys, because it's all about the more we know. We need information, guys. Enjoy the episode. Thanks so much. Renji from Immersed. Welcome to the More We Know podcast with your host and social media influencer, Mir. Gen Z's and millennials need it. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the More We Know podcast. Today, we have Renji Bajoy, who is the founder and CEO of Immersed, a tech stars startup partnered with Facebook to build VR offices. Immersed has tens of thousands of users who work in VR 40 plus hours every week, powered by Facebook's VR headset. Immersed went through Techstars in 2017 and was selected as part of the top 10 of 10,000 startups who competed worldwide and went on to raise almost $4 million to date. Renji has a master's from Georgia Tech in Computer, Vision, and Machine Learning, the number three computer science graduate school in the U.S. Formerly, he was a lead software architect at greatbigstory.com, which he growth hacked to 3 million subscribers in two months. Thank you for being on today, Renji. Yeah, thanks for having me. How are you doing today? Doing well, just... (laughs) <laughs> so Renji what you're doing is amazing you know I, I saw what on wefunder.com your amazing startup but before we get into VR and, and what your company is doing can you take us back and go back a little bit to your childhood what your parents did and just growing up yeah yeah uh, so my parents are immigrants from India they moved to the US maybe about 40 years ago uh, they actually came from uh, a really uh, remote type village uh, very low income all of that uh, so them coming to America was sort of like the promised land. And so uh, when they came to the U.S., they uh, ultimately got, you know, maybe 30, 40 K uh, type jobs uh, and were barely making ends meet. Uh, we then so, so we lived like a two bedroom home, very small. Uh, it was me and my two, my two older sisters. And uh, we were actually living in an area that had a lot of gang activity. And so we ended up leaving and moving to I mean, to be real, like uh, the low income areas of New York, it's going to be gang infested. And so uh, we then moved to. Uh, some of the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, that uh, sort of was the next promised land that had uh, much bigger houses, uh, a lot less expensive, uh, and also higher paying jobs for what my parents were doing. And so uh, we did increase quality of life when I was maybe about the age of eight years old. Um, And ultimately, I grew up there, went to college in uh, the city of Atlanta, I went to Emory University for undergrad, and then like you said, uh, master's from Georgia Tech. Um, Does that sort of make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, it's a great come up, especially, you know, having foreign parents that were necessarily born here and, and to grow up in that struggle, I understand. So with that being said, walk us through the process of going to Emory and then your master's. Why'd you pick that school and, and what was college like for you? Uh-huh. Uh, <clears throat> it was interesting. So uh, just my parents being, uh, to be real, stereotypically uh, Indian parents that wanted me to go be a doctor. Uh, Emory was one, is essentially the Ivy League of the South and they wanted me to specifically go to that school for pre-med. And so I actually did uh, go through the pre-med track, but I also did math and computer science for myself because I knew I was good at math. Um, I knew uh, I loved video games and stuff. And so uh, I checked out the math and computer science degree. So it was almost like a, a biology slash chemistry infused with math and computer science sort of major. And so I would stand out with uh, against other med school applicants. And so I actually went through, took my MCATs, applied to med schools, interviewed, uh, and was waiting to hear back. But ultimately, um, while I was waiting to hear back from med schools, I started working as a software engineer uh, and I loved my job. And I was like, I'm not going to med school. And so <laughs> all of my uh, acceptance letters in the trash, my parents were super upset. Uh, <laughs> I mean, to be real, their perspective was, man, we moved to Atlanta. You know, my, uh, my mom, she uh, moved as close as possible to the university just to kind of uh, inspire me to uh, really uh, go to that school specifically. And uh, she networked her way into uh, working at the uh, university so I get a discount on tuition and things like that. And so they, at the time, saw that as a huge way of saying like, 
why are you going to be a software engineer? You make like a third of whatever doctors make, blah, blah. And uh, the cool thing was um, maybe about, uh, so generally software engineers might take like 10 or 15 years to become like a lead architect uh, at a software development company. But within, uh, I would say like 18 months, I climbed from, you know, entry to mid to senior uh, to eventually a lead architect. And so um, whatever would have taken time, 10 times longer, I was able to accomplish in such a short amount of time because I didn't realize that my brain was wired for coding specifically. I only started coding when I was like 19 years old or 20 years old, uh, whereas a lot of my friends, uh, they coded when, you know, ever since they were little kids. And so my family just didn't have access to technology like that. Uh, and my parents didn't really even know what coding was. So I didn't really have much direction other than go be a doctor. And so yeah. I ultimately um, loved my job, started climbing the ranks and uh, decided to um, pursue my master's uh, at Georgia Tech, mainly because I felt like I hit a ceiling in my software engineering field. And I wanted to move from the web world, you know, greatbigstore.com over to uh, the AI world, which is why I got into machine learning, computer vision, stuff like that. Uh, but then once I was trying to pursue the PhD there, uh, it turns out a lot of the people in the labs there also were pretty stagnant, pretty complacent. Uh, they're down to just tinker with drones and stuff for the rest of their lives. Whereas for me, I wanted to work on uh, building companies and products for people. Um, and so ultimately, I jumped ship to there, just settled, settled for the master's, <clears throat> and then uh, decided to start my own startup. That's awesome, man. That's such a great story. And when getting your master's, were you tackling, because a lot of kids tackle this, were you tackling the idea of, oh, shoot, I might take on a bunch of debt? Uh, actually, no. So uh, I figured out a lot of ways to be scrappy. Like I knew that uh, obviously my parents were going to be able to, we're not going to be able to pay for my tuition. And so I'd have to figure out how to get scholarships and stuff. Uh, but to be real, man, my first uh, semester in college, I was 17 years old, $7,000 in debt. And that hit me really hard. And so whatever cost I had to cover along the way, I actually worked full time while uh, going, taking full time undergrad classes. So uh, the cool thing was I was able to manage my time very well because I didn't have a lot of time to manage. Like I had no free time. And so uh, it was just work school, work school for uh, four years straight and was able to get through without any debt. Um, and then a grad school, uh, fortunately for me, they also had sort of this uh, new sort of course curriculum thing where they were trying to move some of their courses online. And they mentioned that um, if I decided to take the courses online, instead of paying like 40K a year, uh, you would pay 7K for the entire degree, but you could still go to the lab uh, to get work done. Uh, so I saved a ton of money. I was, I just ultimately paid seven uh, K cash for it just cause I was working full time as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not a fan of obviously going to the school debt mainly because a lot of, um, jobs in the industry, like they don't pay nearly as much as how much your school debt was. And so when a lot of, uh, people ask me for, you know, coach my kid, tell my kid to go to college, blah, blah. I mean, to be real in the, in today's like coding bootcamp world or today's like startup building world, there's so many access, there's so much access to resources and access to information on the internet that like, to be real, uh, for certain fields, you don't really even need college. Uh, the field that I'm in, my degrees don't do a ton for me anymore because at this point I'm just building my own company. And so I'm not interviewing around or anything. Um, when I, uh, pitch to venture capitalists to invest in my startup, uh, I'm not really showing off my degrees. I'm mainly showing off, uh, our team, our product and our traction. So makes sense. And I see that's a huge trend for people just not necessarily needing that degree, especially now you look at Harvard is still charging the same tuition for Zoom classes online, which is interesting, right? Um, but that, that makes total sense. But in hindsight, you don't regret your degrees, right? Obviously, you didn't pay for them. Did they teach you? Um, so I, the only, I try not to live with regrets or anything, but I mean, because I'm not really using my degrees anymore, um, I don't regret getting the degrees. I think it was a great experience just kind of going through classes, making a lot of friends, a lot of connections and stuff. That was awesome. Um, I would say that if I could do it over, I would probably go to Georgia Tech for my undergrad and for grad because in hindsight, I found out I didn't want to go to med school. So why learn all this like peripheral stuff that's not very uh, super relevant to what I'm doing? But, I mean, for all I know, maybe I'll sell this company and work on like robotic prosthetics or something. So maybe my biology and chemistry and physics background will come in uh, to play as well. So I don't know. We'll see. Right. That makes sense. And in terms of your team now, your startup, is anyone from college in your time part of your team now? Uh, I had one person who was, but, uh, it turns out the startup world was just too demanding and ultimately had to part ways. Um, and you know, has a wife and kid now and stuff like that. So things are a little bit, was a little bit more difficult for him to uh, keep with the startup. But other than that, uh, no, I did have a grad school friend help out for a little bit as well. Um, but most of the people who we've hired, honestly, like, uh, I'm trying to hire the top engineers in the world. And, uh, unfortunately, like, uh, it's super hard to find someone who's not just smart and not just good at school, but is good at building products and startups. And like, you're looking for someone who has, uh, just amazing ability in so many different verticals. 
Uh, and so most of the time, the chances of them having also been to your school, uh, it's not common, so. Yeah, I hear you. And before we get into Immersed, talk about great big stories. So you, you growth hacked to 3 million subscribers. Can, to, to, can you tell the audience what that means exactly? Yeah, so um, when I, while I was there, um, so the company that owns greatbigstory.com is CNN. Um, just, you know, the news network and uh, they have mainly been targeting, you know, 30 to 70 year old people. And so in order for them to target the younger generation, they created this thing called greatbigstory.com. So if you go to the website, it's just a bunch of two to five minute documentary, uh, documentary clips that will um, ultimately, I mean, it's super addicting. It's just, you just go through video after video after video. Um, it's just a bunch of like human interest pieces. So it's almost like a more millennial version of CNN almost. Um, just letting you know what's kind of going around, uh, what's happening in the world. Um, and ultimately, uh, I was the lead architect to help build that website. They had a video crew that would fly all around the world to like um, New Zealand and Iceland and like random places, random corners of the world to capture very uh, exclusive, but really, really like engaging stories. And so um, for my team, after we had built the website, uh, we were also in charge of getting as many people to subscribe to the website and to ultimately be addicted to the product. And so uh, when I mentioned growth hacking, I'm ma mainly focusing or I'm mainly uh, alluding to figuring out um, clever ways to leverage or exploit certain um, channels in order to drive traffic to your website. So that might mean things like Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Google, whatever, um, but mainly free uh, acquisition channels as opposed to just you know paying for ads or something where it's like dollar in, dollar out sort of thing. Um, that's just not the scalable way to do things at an affordable rate. Uh, and so ultimately, uh, we were able to figure out how to get, uh, yeah, 3 million people to sign up and subscribe to our product uh, within a matter of two months. So, Wow. Well, that's huge. Congrats on that accomplishment. So the big question, man, people going from their job, their corporate life security to I'm going to go do a startup. I'm going to go do entrepreneurship. Tell us about that transition and why you did it, how you did it, and how you came to that decision. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways in which you could do that. And at the end of the day, I've talked to a lot of people about this topic. Um, it really comes down to your motivation. Um, like, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? Um, I think that a lot of people like the idea of being their own boss, but ultimately, uh, there's more to building a company than just being your own boss, right? At the end of the day, like, uh, all, the responsi fall, fall, all the responsibility falls on your shoulders, um, if you're building a type of company that takes in uh, investors or um, any sort of uh, other capital, then your boss now becomes your investors, right? It's no longer just a manager or something, right? So ultimately, it just depends on what the person's motivation is. If they ultimately um, have a passion to provide some sort of value to the world, um, more than just collecting a paycheck, uh, sort of like a nine to five thing, then I would highly recommend it. Um, if they're mainly just trying to live outside of work hours, um, and just kind of live it up, whatever. I mean, to be real, a nine to five job is more chill um, than building your own company. Building your own company takes a ton of time, effort. Um, it's super draining. And although, you know, on Instagram or Facebook, whatever, or YouTube, you might find uh, some influencers, for example, who are kind of living it up, but they don't see, people don't see the uh, overnight success that happened years in advance, right? And so um, I think people just kind of want the benefits of owning your own company without wanting to put in the hard work. So all that to say, I mean, if you get to a point of uh, get to a point where you're not very uh, satisfied with your job, uh, you're kind of tired of just like uh, doing whatever you're doing at work, and you want to be able to provide more value to the world. I mean, you could ultimately uh, reach back to your like humane roots of like you know back in the day before there were large corporations. You know, I'm talking uh, prior to the 1500s, for example, right? Um, people, the way villages worked, for example, was you had a certain trade that you could um, essentially trade with another person and ultimately be able to provide value to them and they provide value to you. So it's more of this sort of uh, uh, contributing mentality as opposed to just uh, collecting a paycheck at a large corporate company that has everything taken care of for you sort of thing. That's just more so uh, something that was brought into being in more recent uh, centuries. So uh, probably even just the past 100 years, 150 years. So all that to say, um, I feel like obviously in America, we're spoiled in regards to having corporate jobs. But um, I think that a lot of people yearn for something more. A lot of people desire to build something greater than what they're just collecting at their nine, nine to five job. And so all that to say, um, if that is the case, then at the end of the day, like look and see like where you're, I think Mark Cuban says this, um, look and see not just what you're passionate about, but what you're passionate about and where that aligns with what you're actually good at too. If those two things align, you can figure out a business and provide value to people with that. Yeah. 
That's some great insight. And something you touched on that I think is very important is, like you said, those influencers. We see on social media the good life. Um, it's, it's caused a lot of people to put that entrepreneurship in their bio on Instagram when they might not even have a business, right? So I think that's awesome because it's what you do in those hours behind the screen, behind what you're posting on Instagram that really counts. I know you, you know, in your corporate job, when you were at uh, Great Big Story, you probably had a, a set schedule, I'm, I'm assuming, of 40 to 50 hours, right? But now with Immersed, I know you're not working 40 hours. <laughs> yeah, it's more probably closer to 60 to 70 hours now. Um, but the cool thing is, um, you probably heard, heard of this uh, quote before, but it, but it says, um, if you love what you do for your job, you'll never work a day in your life. And so for me, because I just love what we're building, it doesn't even feel like working. Like I don't have to like muster up the willpower to start building this product. I just enjoy the product and, I, and my team uses this product. Uh, and, and that's also even the type of people that we hire for this uh, company. Like we intentionally pay super low uh, it intentionally like it, the, the goal is not hire the world's uh, best talent uh, in exchange for a ton of money because they could just get a higher paying job at Google or Facebook or whatever. Um, but instead, ultimately incentivizing people to come to Immersed because I mean, what they're building is going to be uh, transforming the world as far as you know teleporting into an office with a pair of glasses someday, right? Without ever having to commute ever again. Um, and even just you and I being able to have this sort of interview again feeling like we're right across the physical table just by putting on a pair of Facebook or Apple glasses. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. What you're bringing up like this podcast, for example, back in the day, you wouldn't be able to create a podcast just on what we're doing on zoom and being able to instantaneously get it there. So that's a great transition into immersed. Let's say, I don't know anything about AI. I don't know anything about technology startups. I don't know what the word immersed means. What is immersed? Yeah. So um, ultimately what we're building is, uh, a product that enables people to be able to teleport into the virtual world uh, and specifically be able to work with their remote team. So uh, what this looks like is, yeah, four or five years from now when Facebook uh, or Apple comes out with their uh, augmented reality glasses, uh, you'll feel like you're immediately teleported into another world. And so if you've never tried uh, virtual reality, which is available today at a pretty low cost, um, you should definitely try it. Like when you put the headset on, a lot of people haven't tried it ever. So when you actually put the headset on, you literally feel like you're in another place. Um, and so uh, the cool thing is we're partnered with Facebook. Um, we're somewhat of a small team. We're about three years old as a company. Um, and we're a team of about 12 people. We're hiring like four more positions. So it'll be about 16 people. Um, and uh, really, as of today, we have thousands of users who work in VR 40 plus hours every week. They just literally have their headset on for maybe like two hour sessions at a time. Uh, maybe two to four hour sessions and, you know, two to four sessions a day. So about eight hours a day and ultimately five days a week, about 40 hours plus uh, every week. And so uh, they're able to uh, virtually teleport into the same space. And so what that does is um, if you think about kind of the way the corporate office, uh, the corporate office used to work before COVID, for example, um, for example, a group of uh, coding engineers, they would have uh, all of their computers around each other. They would code together. They would whiteboard together. Um, designers would do the same thing. They would have Photoshop up on this screen. They would have different um, inspiring material up on this screen. They would have uh, things printed out and posted on the whiteboard and they'd be scribbling on stuff just to kind of get their creative juices flowing. Um, but now that everyone's working from home, the best thing we, we have right now is Zoom uh, and sharing one screen. It's not the same as having five screens uh, per person and being able to point and click and all of that type of stuff. And so Immerse enables you to put on a VR headset and teleport into that virtual world, which is literally the same thing as that. You put on the headset, you see you're surrounded by five screens. Uh, as soon as you want to collaborate with your coworker, they can beam into your space. You can share, you can click, you can uh, type together, you can whiteboard together using your uh, bare hands, which is really, really cool. Um, so ultimately, uh, quite literally, uh, removing the need for there to ever have to be um, a physical corporate office or any physical commute. People won't have to uh, fly to their uh, consulting jobs or drive to their uh, you know, centralized city, downtown, local, corporate campus, whatever. Um, and ultimately the goal would be for companies to be able to have access to global talent, but also people all around the world for being able to have access to working at the top companies like Facebook or Google, whatever, without having to be, or without having to relocate to San Francisco or wherever, right? You could uh, live on a boat and just teleport to the office uh, in New York City or something, right? So. Yeah. Just, just so cool. I mean, what you're doing, it's, it's amazing. But to be, to clarify, so Immersed is not necessarily the Oculus device, it's the software, right? You're building the right. software. Yeah, so, so we're uh, just going to allow the tech giants like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, focus on the hardware, the next generation of computing, which will be AR glasses. Uh, the first steps that they're taking today is these sort of different VR headsets. 
Um, and I actually have one over there, but I can, uh, you can Google it as well. Just go to oculus.com, for example. Um, and so they're focusing on the hardware. We're focusing on the software. Um, so think about almost how uh, an analogy would be how Zoom works on uh, your iPhone, it works on your laptop, it works on different devices, and it ties all the different devices together. Um, and Zoom is just the software. Likewise, with Immersed, when the next generation of computing, being glasses or VR headsets or whatever, comes out made by different manufacturers like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, um, Immersed will be that central Zoom for the virtual world that'll tie all the different hardwares together um, and will enable people to be able to beam into the same virtual office as if they were uh, physically side by side. Wow, that's amazing. And the Zoom example you used, that really put into perspective for me and I'm sure the audience. So let's take it to an actual corporate example. So let's say you have a meeting with your manager coming up and you have a PowerPoint presentation you need to present or they need you on the board to show some numbers for uh, an upcoming uh, budget analysis, correct? So we can both put on our Oculus goggles and we can use Immersed and I can actually write on the board and my manager can see what I'm doing It like we're actually in the office? Yeah, like quite literally as if your manager was right here and you're both at the whiteboard right here, right? Like uh, the goal is to quite literally recreate what you have in real life, um, but then on top of that, be able to optimize things that are not possible in real life, such as um, say for example, you're in a 15 person meeting, but uh, someone's calling you and you need to immediately teleport to like a, uh, a virtual phone booth or something, right? With Immerse, you'd be able to just click a button and teleport real quick, take the phone call and then teleport back. Whereas in the real world, you have to kind of get up, inter interrupt the meeting, kind of scoot between the chairs, go outside, find a place, all that type of stuff. Um, and the cool thing is, so you get all the benefits of what you have uh, as far as in-person collaboration, just like what you mentioned, as far as uh, being in the same space, being able to whiteboard together, being able to code together, being able to um, present on a uh, projector, for example, together. Um, but also the benefits of being solo, working from home, where you can kind of be in an isolated environment, uh, literally just within uh, the, the a quick click of the trigger, if that makes sense. So um, that's what that's, that's something that like, uh, if you think about life in general, like over the past however many decades, more and more of our lives have become more and more uh, digitalized or uh, virtualized. So you think about uh, like libraries, right? Information, library books. Uh, eventually, all access information was eventually moved to the internet and became virtualized. Uh, and then, it, but back in the day, computers were more bulky type things, but then that became more virtualized to a phone in your pocket sort of thing. Yeah. So as things become more and more virtualized, you get to a point where uh, if you haven't seen the movie Ready Player One, you should check it out. You know, Steven, Steel, uh, Steven Spielberg uh, directed it and it was an amazing movie. Um, but they sort of talk about how the world becomes more and more virtualized. And so everyone um, meets in sort of this virtual world. Uh, they put on their AR glasses and uh, it sort of shows you what the future is going to look like. Um, all that to say, uh, as Immerse figures out uh, what the best use case is for people specifically in the work context looks like, um, ultimately our goal is to make people more productive in the virtual world than they could possibly be in the real world. Uh, and, and so an example of that today is, for example, like we have uh, parents who are working from home because of COVID, but they also have their kids at home and they're super distracted. So they, they, you know, without Immerse, they'll put on their Bose headphones and they'll see their little screen right in front of them, but then their kids are running around them, right? And they still see it. Whereas with Immerse, you have your headset, you're in another world with your headset on, especially with your headphones on as well. Um, and you just do not have the distractions at all. You're very, uh, you know, you're in a very private distraction-free workspace. It's, uh, you could be sitting in, like the cool thing is, uh, we have a lot of really, really cool environments too, where uh, you're like in sort of this space space spaceship that has massive windows that's orbiting the earth you see the massive earth it's just like a chill relaxing environment you have all your screens around you you get in sort of sort of this flow state and you get all of your work done two to three times faster than you would if you had all these distractions around you right and then as soon as you do need to collaborate with someone if ever um depending on your job or whatever it is they can beam into that same space be in the same space as you collaborate and as soon as you're done they can beam back to their own solo mode so it's just a very um productive way of working in general yeah, and I didn't even think about that for everyone who has been working from home so much, you know, you see the living room or for people that have families, you can only see the kids so much, right? So that fact that you could put that on and be in an office is really, really cool. Yeah, and that's another thing that like uh, a lot of parents have been telling us that like before, uh, so the cool thing with uh, people working from home now is they're able to spend more time with their families. The downside is they get crazy distracted. And so, um, you know, mommy or daddy might be working in the upstairs room, but like kids are like knocking on the door, open the door, open the door or whatever, or um, even before COVID, even before people were um, working from home, you know, mommy or daddy would have to leave the house at, you know, 8 a.m. in the morning to get to work at nine. 
uh, and then they would have to work till like six and then they have another hour commute back, back home. So they get home at like seven, seven thirty, And so like that entire time is gone as opposed to, Hey, just you know, mom, your dad, you can put on a pair of glasses. They're in the office, take it off. Now they're back home. Right. So there's no time on commute. Um, you know, there's no travel necessary. I, I, I have friends who are consultants uh, who have kids and they have to fly out on Monday or Sunday night. And then they fly back in uh, Thursday night or, or Friday morning and they're gone the entire week from apart from their families. Whereas uh, with Immersed, you'd be able to just put on a pair of glasses every day um, and you're still physically there if some emergency happens or whatever. But as soon as you need to get back to the real world, real world take the glasses off and, and you're back with your family. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's so cool. It's, it's revolutionary, essentially, is what I think. And so let's say, take it for example, consulting, right? You look at a company like Accenture, um, you're gone Sunday, you're back or gone Sunday, Monday, back Thursday, Friday and you're meeting with a client, you might be selling something or working on a new project. Um, can this, so you can use this with outside employees too. You don't have to be in Microsoft Teams together or Zoom together. I, let's say you work at a company, I work at a company, we can still meet together. Yeah, so uh, we're actually talking with companies like Deloitte, Accenture, uh, Ernst & Young, et cetera. Um, and a lot of the cool use cases they're thinking about is uh, just, well, first off, just thinking about the, the, the big picture, the amount of money that they save by not having to spend money on flights, hotels, car rentals for all of their employees, um, things like food budgets, et cetera. And instead, they'll, they'll just ship a uh, $400 headset to a client and be like, hey, just meet me in VR and we'll work together that way. And it saves a ton of time, a ton of money. Um, and so uh, the cool thing is, as we, as we sort of like figure out what that use case looks like, we do want to eventually generalize the product more so it can kind of fit uh, different uh, clients and uh, companies needs. Um, but one thing that we obviously haven't figured out is how do you sort of allow clients and uh, companies to, uh, you know, have lunches together or something, right? Like you just, you can't, there's no virtual yeah. food, right? So uh, maybe, you know, go in person, land the deal, build a little bit of a relationship, but then eventually get to a point where, Hey, we have a solid enough relationship. We can kind of just do this virtually. And then maybe periodically once a quarter or whatever, we'll kind of fly together, have our meals again, and then we'll kind of, uh, go virtual again. So it yeah. just sort of augments the current experience. Um, and ultimately, again, it's just a better overall quality of life because, uh, for example, one of my friends, he has a uh, two-year-old daughter um, every Sunday night would fly out to uh, New York City from Atlanta um, and then would uh, get a car rental, drive down to Connecticut at the client, and then some, some point Monday early morning uh, would get to his hotel, leave stuff there, immediately go to work and just be super dead tired. And then working like crazy all week, go back to a hotel where there's no food, you have to like order food, whatever. It's like super annoying. And then Friday or Thursday night would take the car rental, drive back to New York City, get on a plane, go back down to Atlanta, spend time with his family, but he's already tired. And so the weekend, he can't even really spend time with his kids, mainly because he's drained from the week and the time he wants to spend with his kids, he just like, I wish I had the energy to do so, but I'm just so tired from the week, so I need the weekend to recover to do go do it again on Monday morning. And yeah. it's man, it's just not a good quality of life. <laughs> yeah. And I think when you say that, I, I, it just, it brings up so many, you know, ideas in my head of what you guys are changing. And I'd like to think, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert, but typically when you look at a startup that gets that unicorn valuation, right? You look at an Uber or Lyft, typically even Amazon, the trend is you have to disrupt another industry to get to that type of level. And what I'm thinking when I'm hearing you, it's almost like in a way, are you guys, are you guys, you think you're disruptors to the airline industry? Cause airline revenue, a lot of it is from the business travel. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. That was something that a lot of investors had brought up that as Immerse continues to grow and as, as Facebook and Apple come out with their glasses, for example, and it becomes very uh, ubiquitous or very popular um, and very common, people are just going to make an excuse as to not need to really travel mainly for work. When it comes to things like going on vacation, uh, th that will still be there because um, a vacation in VR probably, I mean, at least for the next, I would say decade or so, it probably wouldn't be the same thing. You won't feel yeah. the girl, <laughs> that type of yeah. stuff. Uh, apparently in the movie Ready Player One, they, they accomplished all of that. But um, all that to say, like, uh, I was even just sort of imagining a world where no one would really be on the roads for commuting to work anymore. It would be more so they're either going to the airport or the grocery store or maybe basketball or whatever. Um, but no one would be on the roads anymore. There, there, would, no, no more, there would be no more traffic uh, jams. People could easily get from point A to point B because there's just way less cars on the road. Um, yeah. So there, there, you know, people would say it would disrupt the gasoline industry because of cars. Um, I know Tesla's already doing that with elect, uh, electric cars. Um, people are talking about, yeah, disrupting the hotel or the um, air travel industry as well. But I think that they, everyone will sort of figure out how to um, shift their businesses to meet the, the current needs of people, right? So um, ultimately, like, like even if you think about the, uh, the carriage or, or like the carriage industry way back 100 years ago with like horses and carriages and stuff, right? When cars came out, 
people had to figure out, all right, well, is there a need for carriages? If not, let's do away with it. If there is, then we'll figure out how to get that business model working. And carriages are more so for uh, leisure or for kind of, you know, hanging out, chilling, whatever. And it went from being a core transportation to owning a horse for like leisure or whatever. And so there's still like a horse industry or whatever, but now there's a car industry for uh, being a staple, right? And so as things progress, if we figure out teleportation, for example, right, people will still have cars for uh, being able to, I don't know, I don't know how expensive it'll be to teleport someday, but like uh, people will be able to go from like, you know, uh, maybe a quarter mile away for using their car and not have to teleport or something, right? So all that to yeah. say, um, I don't think this is a zero sum game. I don't think that just because we win in a certain way, airlines and hotels will plummet um, necessarily. I think that they'll just have to figure out how to uh, still provide value. And I think that that's important. If, if airlines are not continuing to, uh, continuing to drive value and actually uh, like, like why should people pay them, right? Um, if you think about even just like Uber disrupting the taxi cab industry, um, ultimately like the taxi cab industry was already very inefficient. Um, whereas Uber just provided more value to people. And so because of that, they're rewarded with more money than the taxi cab industry. And so if the taxi cab industry wants to stay competitive, they need to figure out how to provide actual value to people and not be like, hey, we were here first. This is our money. This is our industry. That's just not the way that the world uh, goes around. So, Yeah, totally. That makes sense. So James Gorman, the CEO of Morgan Stanley, said that there's something they're evaluating is real estate, right? They're questioning how much of that office real estate they need. Do you think Immersed, I, we talk about disruption, but in terms of saving costs, do you think we're going to have a future with Immersed where it's no physical offices? We're all going to be just like this? Yeah, so a lot of companies already do that. Um, so and not even using Immersed, even just using Zoom, for example, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, Twitter said that they're no longer going to have offices, period. Uh, same thing with Square. Um, what, what else? Uh, uh, there's a company called GitLab. Uh, they, they're a pretty large company as well. It's kind of like GitHub. Uh, they have never had an office. They've been 100% work from home. So all, this, all that to say, like plenty of massive companies uh, already work from home. And so I think that that's already where things uh, have been shifting. And so uh, I do believe that we'll have a world where, man, co commercial real estate is going to have to figure out a way to uh, again, drive, provide value to people, right? It might be more shopping, retail, whatever. I know Amazon disrupted a lot, uh, but ultimately there's still a good experience of like going into the store and browsing around. It's just a different experience, right? So some people are still going to want to do that. It'll just probably have to look a little bit different. Even things like uh, movie theaters, right? One of my friends uh, owns a, like the, the most popular VR movie theater app. Um, and it's a really, really cool experience. And mainly, mainly also because like, even when you watch 3D movies in VR, it's so much better than 3D movies in real life because 3D movies in real life, you have these glasses and only part of your field of view is taken up. But in VR, it's your entire field of view. So you just don't even feel like you're wearing glasses. You're just looking at a 3D screen. It's so crazy. Wow. It's such a cool experience. Yeah. But um, the downside is you can't eat virtual popcorn, right? Things like that. <laughs> yeah. You get virtual Slurpee. Like you can make the sound effects, but you don't have the <laughs> station, right? And so you don't have your friends. I mean, it, it is a networked app. So you can have friends who also have your headsets to join you in there. But it's just not the same as kind of going in person, getting the popcorn, getting the slushy, all the, the cool experience. Yeah. And so all that to say, uh, until we sort of figure out how to also incorporate things like smell and taste, um, there's still going to be a need for physical things, right? Like even just a uh, cool breeze and being at the beach or whatever, right? Like, yeah, we can re recreate the sounds in VR uh, and the visuals, but as far as the, the feel on your skin and things like that, that's just not there today, man. So. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Even if you look at the NBA, they're doing those Microsoft team games. Yeah. So, and it's, it's different than being at an actual basketball game. Exactly. It's not the same energy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, to transition, a lot of companies, it's, it's a concern these days with data, right? Hacking and, and integ data integrity. So is there any concern if I'm a manager and I'm a senior executive and we have some high level private information, what's, what's the concern there and, and what is Immerse doing to uh, protect people's information? If you can answer yeah. that. So all of our uh, peer to peer connections, number one, they're peer to peer. So they don't go through any server or anything. Um, all of your screen data goes straight from one person to the other and it's all 256 bit encrypted. So um, good luck breaking that. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, because also everything, even in solo mode is all local on your local network. We're not streaming stuff through the cloud. The only thing that's streaming through the cloud would be things like um, your voice, uh, avatar movement, and things like that. And because we do it at scale, it's kind of hard and difficult to, to find whose stream is what. Again, all their names, all that stuff is uh, encrypted. It's impossible to, to, to break that type of stuff. I mean, we are going to continue uh, getting more and more security audits on our product to make sure that uh, we can uh, plug whatever holes that we can even find uh, in our product. And that will be things that we, uh, as we grow and, and, and sort of move at scale, we'll continue to spend more and more resource towards uh, making sure that this thing is private, right? I know that um, Facebook has had issues with 
uh, data privacy and things like that. I really love the way Apple handles all of this. And so I'd rather kind of go the Apple route for that um, in regards to us not really caring about uh, whose identity is whose, but more so just knowing that there are people that exist and let them worry about their own identity, similar to how, how Apple handles it as opposed to Facebook. So Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And so you've been working on Emerge, correct, for three years now? Uh, three and a half years, yeah. Three and a half years. And obviously you didn't expect the pandemic, right? So uh -huh. what, what changed? I mean, you've been working on this for time, so you had the vision regardless, but how much more did the pandemic change this where it's like, boom, it's time to skyrocket? I mean, it's the timing, right? Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people kind of talked about how uh, COVID has only accelerated things that were already going to happen anyway, meaning uh, things like remote work or things like um, uh, like like in-store shopping and things like that, right? Grocery shopping, like instead of going to the grocery store, now getting groceries delivered, uh, things like that. So um, yes, you're right. I had the vision three plus years ago, mainly because every software development team I've ever been on or led in previous uh, companies I used to work at, we always had some people who were just on Zoom, for example, right? Uh, or at least back then it would be something like Microsoft Teams or whatever, uh, Skype or whatever. And so ultimately, um, it was very clear that those of us who were here in person uh, were having the main discussion and everyone on the video call were just listening in. They weren't really, able, because of the lag, because of they, they weren't able to come here in person or write whiteboard with us. Uh, they might interject here and there, but it's always this like awkward, like uh, interruption, uh, things like that. And so all, all that to say, um, as we uh, have been figuring out how to uh, ultimately like uh, work more effectively remotely and, and more and more companies were allowing remote work, uh, we ultimately uh, realized, hey, no matter what we do, this video call is just not gonna be the same as in person. This two dimensional screen where I can't do, I can't, I can't cut, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the cool thing about the virtual world is uh, you could recreate all of that, right? You do have 3D presence, you have uh, a voice, you can manipulate the entire virtual world as if it was the real world. Um, and all that to say, um, we, we ultimately like wanted to sort of figure out how do we um, create the in-person experience for remote teams as things continue to rise and once COVID hit, you know, it was already kind of, remote work was already kind of moving up and maybe backwards for you, whatever. Uh, I was already kind of moving up and then COVID hit and then it spiked. Um, and, and that spike was going to happen at some point, whether it be uh, a pandemic or a world war or whatever it is. I mean, I don't want to be super dystopian, but a lot of these sort of events, I mean, when there's chaos, it just almost accelerates things, if that makes sense. And so ultimately, um, COVID hitting was beneficial for us because people had to work from home more. Um, and that's when Facebook had reached out. Uh, Facebook had actually um, tried, there's like 35 or 40 different competitors in our space, um, and Facebook had tried all of them, and ultimately Immerse was the one that they had deemed as the best user experience, uh, the product that had the highest user usage, um, and so they reached out to us asking if we wanted to partner, and obviously we said yes. So, wow. we That's awesome. So you didn't even reach out to Facebook, they reached out to you guys. I tried to in the previous years, but Facebook had, specifically for VR, they mainly focused on gaming previously, um, but then once COVID hit, they realized a very clear enterprise challenges that I've been, you know, pitching for the past three years. Um, and it's funny, like the previous Oculus conferences, it's funny, like uh, the research scientist would uh, take more and more of the pitch I've been giving and start pitching it himself even more um, uh, from the public stage. And so um, the cool thing is obviously as uh, Immerse has been just sort of faithful, focusing on the product, uh, iterating with our small group of users who love our product and kind of slowly growing it from there, Facebook then realized, hey, this is a team that really does care about their users. Uh, they provided a great experience for the users and really ultimately figured out a way to get people to work in VR 40 plus hours a week. And so that's when they reached out. Um, and there's a lot that's happening this fall. I'm not allowed to uh, share about it's under NDA and stuff like that. But um, I'm just really excited about what the future looks like for Emerge. So. Yeah, well, congrats on Facebook. That's huge. And congrats on the future success you'll continue to have. So in terms of you know, you have the Facebook deal, everything going on. Talk about, you raised almost $4 million. How did you raise almost $4 million? <laughs> um, so, so the first, uh, like 1.8 of that uh, was over time. Uh, in 2017, uh, it was funny. Like we raised a small 340K round at the beginning of 20, or the end of 2017. Uh, and at that point, our code was six weeks old. <laughs> so we didn't have a ton of... Uh, we didn't have a ton of access to capital anyway to begin with. So uh, we just ha found a couple of uh, small checks that ultimately uh, believed in us. They, they saw the demo, they saw the vision based on our pitch. Uh, and ultimately uh, through, once we graduated from that Techstars program uh, that you mentioned earlier in this conversation, um, I mean, during those Techstars demo days, there are a lot of investors who have eyeballs on this. And the ones that 
understand the vision or the ones that were like, Hey, let's put in a check. Let's see what happens. It's not gonna be a large check, a small check, but let's see what you do with it. And so, uh, for all of 2018, uh, we had just focused on productizing our prototype, right? How do we get from this crappy prototype to at least a usable product to get some users to start using it? Um, and then at the end of 2018, uh, another v a venture capital firm reached out to us and said uh, that they wanted to inject another 250K uh, just to kind of uh, make the product even better because they had already started hearing about Immersed. And so uh, th that initial, uh, th that next 250K then got us to hire maybe one or two more people. And so eventually just kind of slowly snowballing. Um, the largest round we did before this we funder was uh, a $1 million round. And so oh. it yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's, to be real in the grand scheme of things and sort of the grand scheme of the startup world, it's not massive, um, but it's, it's plenty of what we're doing. Um, or at least we've figured out how to be very lean, very scrappy. Um, a lot of startups, I mean, they might raise five, 10, 20, 50 million dollars and then blow through it, right? There's a company, for example, called Magic Leave. I don't want to like uh, blow them up too much, but like they raised like four billion dollars, something crazy. Um, yeah. And they're now on the brink of shutting down. So all that to say, I think there are definitely very scrappy ways to build companies. And if anything, it really impresses the next investor. Uh, I remember back when we raised uh, the million dollars earlier this spring, um, uh, the, the VCs that looked at our, uh, our books, they were like, wait, you only raised like 750K in the past like three years? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, what, how the crap, how did you build this robust of a product with this solid uh, of a team? with just 700, 750K. And it sounds, 750K might sound like a lot of money, but um, if we're a team of seven people for three years, that's like 30K a year per person. Like it's, it's super low right, if yeah. you do the math and break it down. So uh, it's just like a small amount of money to build sort of such a robust product. So all that to say, uh, it just made the next set of investors realize, wow, this is a very capital efficient company. Um, if I put money in this company, my dollar is going to go a lot further than if, it, than if I put it in another company, like maybe Magic Leap or whatever, right? And so <laughs> ultimately, uh, we then took that 1 million and uh, started just continuing to iterate on the product. We actually didn't think we'd raise a we funder. Um, we all, we actually uh, applied to this uh, thing called the XX cohort um, on we funder. Um, ultimately it's just, you know, out of, I think something like two or 3000 uh, startups that applied worldwide to this uh, XX cohort program that provides uh, some of the top uh, mentors in the world. Um, and, and by top mentors, I mean, uh, there's this program called Y Combinator. Um, companies like uh, Reddit, Twitch, um, what, else, what else came out of there? Uh, Airbnb, Dropbox, Stripe, a lot of these very large companies came out of Y Combinator. Uh, and they're, those, the, the founders, uh, like a lot of founders from the Y Combinator program uh, who have exited and are not now mentoring companies, they were going to mentor through this XX program. So I'm like, man, if I get into this program, this would be great for mentorship. I didn't even think about WeFunder at this point. Um, but that, that XX cohort is affiliated with WeFunder. And towards the end of the program, they talked about, hey, have you considered uh, fundraising on WeFunder? Obviously, I, I was like, hey, we actually just raised a million bucks. I think we're good for a little while. Um, for us, that would have been like an extra, like you know, the million bucks would take us maybe another year and a half, uh, 18 months, which is plenty of time for us to figure out our revenue, et cetera, as we released mm -hmm. the Oculus Store you know, as of uh, two weeks ago. And so uh, as we were uh, figuring out whether or not we should do the WeFunder, we realized well, we're about to, again, a month ago, we we're like, oh, we're about to uh, release to the Oculus store. What if we can sort of mobilize or financially incentivize our users to spread the word? And so if users realize, hey, we're partnered with Facebook, um, hey, they have, you know, $10,000 or $5,000 or whatever into a WeFunder uh, crowdfunding campaign for Immersed, uh, then ultimately they're going to want to tell everyone, hey, you should invest in this and tell the world that Immersed is now going to be available on the Oculus store. Um, and so that did spiral like crazy. And like you uh, saw, I mean, even just how you found us. Uh, it was uh, one of WeFunder's largest uh, successful campaigns. And so uh, they had mentioned how we just broke uh, a ton of their records. And so uh, we had raised uh, a million bucks within just a few hours. And then within just a couple, a few days after that, we had hit the $2 million mark. And so that's where we decided to cut it off. We don't want to dilute our company too much, but uh, we're right from that. That's amazing. And a million bucks in a few hours, that's, that's, that's insane. So. But so I was that was going to be yeah, it is mind blowing. The question I was going to follow up is you know there's Start Engine, there's Republic, there's so many different startup sites that I'm sure you're familiar with. But you said so you picked WeFunder because of the specific program that they had. Yeah, so um, I, I I knew about um, Republic. Um, I knew I've known about. Uh, sorry, someone's here. No, you're good. Uh, so I had known about Republic. I'd known about different uh, public crowdfunding campaigns. Uh, but to be real, I just had not considered it. 
um, mainly because again, I knew that we had the money that we had and we didn't really need to fundraise. But yes, because, because we were part of the XX cohort and because to be real, they made a lot of great points around how this would mobilize a lot of our users. But on top of that, being able to allow friends and family to invest in Immerse before Immerse starts to skyrocket, um, this would be a great opportunity for us to figure out how to distribute capital to uh, our friends and family who've been supportive all along the way, as opposed to just making rich VCs even richer, right? Yeah. Um, and, and ultimately, it was awesome to be able to get all of our friends and family uh, some equity in the company and uh, them just be a great voice from the mountaintops to spread to the world how awesome Immersed is, so. Yeah, that's amazing. And what would you say there's a difference between crowdfunding versus venture capital, like raising? Um, very different, yeah, venture capital, um, is it's essentially like it's it's a business that exists to invest in startups, but it's led by uh, specific individuals who are the managing partners or just general partners at uh, these firms. And so uh, those individuals have a lot of uh, power or control over your company if they invest in you, as opposed to if you do crowdfunding, then you are still the sole board of director in the company. And uh, it's just a bunch of random people trying to kind of get their money in the company before it skyrockets into like an Airbnb or Uber type company, if that makes sense. Um, and so whereas with venture capitals or VC, uh, VCs, ultimately, uh, there's a lot more politics. Um, they, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna make a blanket statement about all VCs, but I would say most VCs oftentimes are not founders and they don't really know what to focus on, focus on your business like what area is the most important to focus on. And so they'll like assert their opinion and almost try to enforce their opinion. Um, but at the end of the day, they're not the founder of the company and they don't know what's the best thing. Like you as a founder of your startup, you obsess over this problem, you and your team. And ultimately like uh, if a VC maybe thinks about your company like two hours a week, they're obviously not gonna know the best route forward as a company. Yeah. So all that to say, like uh, I think some of the strongest VCs are really just people who uh, ultimately like will write the check, will support you if you need the help, but are mainly hands off. They pretty much only respond whenever you reach out to them for connections or whatever it is. Um, and so ultimately, like we do have uh, an awesome VC firm who supported us called Sovereigns Capital. They've been great. Um, honestly, they, I love that VC firm, but they're, they're, so, they're so unique. That is not common at all. The vast majority are very controlling and very distracting. And that could lead to the death of your startup. So if anything, if you could ultimately, um, if, if I were to give advice to someone who's starting their company, um, number one, obviously just execute well on your own. And once your company gets to a point where it's very clear that this is a good deal to invest in, then open up a crowdfunding campaign and ultimately uh, try to raise funds apart from VC firms. And, and on top of that, uh, don't raise a ton of money because you won't be motivated to uh, crank your revenue up or figure out how to make revenue. So, yeah. and that will lead to uh, the death of your company anyway, right? So. Right, right. That's great advice. And for people that are new, new entrepreneurs, new startup, uh, you know, they're starting their own company, are you recommending to them WeFunder specifically or just open to the idea of crowdfunding? Um, to be real, I have never, I've never really, I, I heard about, uh, one of my friends who kind of went through Republic. Uh, there are mixed reviews. I think that, I think all the different campaigns or, or crowdfunding campaign companies are figuring out how to be the best at this. Um, at least my experience with WeFunder was obviously good. <laughs> we had yeah. a this whole campaign, but I think a lot of it really does come down to the startup, right? Like what is the deal that, uh, the different campaigns are offering, but at the end of the day, the campaign or the, the company, the crowdfunding company is not going to raise the money for you. Um, ultimately you have to figure out how to stand out amongst all the other campaigns that are running simultaneously. And so, uh, with Immerse, obviously like, because I have a background in growth hacking, figuring out how do I get the most eyeballs on my product? In this case, how do I get the most eyeballs on my campaign? Uh, and obviously it worked out. So yeah. <laughs> we really, and just, and uh, explore page for like two weeks straight. And so yeah. right now, like literally I have like seven more emails. Uh, just from random investments in the past like 15 minutes. So Right. And I mean, whether you got the $2 million or not on WeFunder, it's the SEO, right? Just being on there is huge. People, yeah. people get it because obviously I didn't hear about it until I saw it on WeFunder. Yeah. So I think that's awesome. Um, where do you see, you know, we're here now, August, but where do you see your company in the next 10 years? Yeah. Um, hopefully in 10 years from now and hopefully before 10 years from now, uh, the definition of what it means to go to work would be to put on a pair of glasses powered by Immersed. Um, I, I would love if that, because at that point, we're not just a unicorn and we're not just a decacorn company, but if anything, uh, we would be honestly like somewhere around the Facebook or Apple sized uh, company kind of stage, right? Like if we're pushing a trillion dollar valuation, I mean, you know, you're one of the most influential companies in the world. And so uh, if you are able to pull off, you know, becoming the definition of what it means to go to work, uh, that is definitely within reach as far as being that uh, valued as a company. I think ultimately like, uh, the coolest thing is being able to have that much impact, being able to have that much reach all around the world, right? So um, I think that our company will have been successful, not just if 
Uh, we are the definition of what it means to go to work. But I think ultimately if anyone is able to work at any company on earth, regardless of where you live, um, and regardless of what you look like or regardless of any disabilities or whatever, and can teleport just by putting on a pair of glasses, um, I think that we will have uh, served our purpose as a company. Yeah. And, you know, just from my conversation with you, I think you're obviously the guy to lead it. You're an awesome guy and you seem very motivated. So that's awesome. Uh, what about in terms of, do you see Immerse getting into the idea of schools and uh, other, other asp avenues, you know, even in hospital patient visits? I don't know. There's so many things, yeah. right? So, um, yeah, like as of right now, there are plenty of uh, professors and schools that are already starting to use Immerse. And so I, I mainly kind of talk about the work use case, mainly because that's the one I'm personally most uh, familiar with and, and can empathize with. Um, but there are professors, I, obviously, obviously I went to school, so like I know what the classroom setting looks like and all of that. Um, as far as hospitals, that's a little bit different. Um, things like remote surgeries and things like that, uh, there are other companies who are working on that. Uh, it would be super cool if we, we do really, really well in sort of the corporate environment and really well in education. Uh, and then have a subset of the company focused on things like uh, healthcare or whatever, right? And so um, I think that, I mean, there's definitely a plan or sort of, there's, there's definitely a, a path forward towards those different industries. Um, and I would love to be able to generalize, but I think to start with, if we're not uh, laser focused and if we're too uh, spread thin on our um, outlook on what we're tackling, I think that this would be very difficult to execute on. So ultimately, yeah. like right now, yeah, focused on uh, remote distributed teams, people who are working from home using a computer specifically, um, but then when it comes to teachers, that's sort of the next thing. Um, how do they sort of recreate the classroom environment with a projector, et cetera? Um, and then from there, how do we sort of, yeah, branch into things like healthcare or uh, the food industry? I don't even know how the food industry would work. Maybe yeah. we have a virtual ordering system or something. I, I don't know. We haven't thought that far ahead. Yeah, yeah. That's great to hear. So, you know, you got the Facebook deal, you raised some money. And, you know, what are three things you would tell aspiring entrepreneurs to do or, or what, what can separate, you know, from other competition, right? Because Facebook could have picked someone else, but what are three things that you would say that could separate your business because competition is inevitable? Yeah. Yeah. No, hundred um, percent. Yeah. So, so a couple of things uh, just on the topic of competition to begin with, I mean, to be real, most startups do not fail because of competition. Uh, even though Uber is a great company, Lyft also exists. Uber, yes, is four times, three or four times as big as Lyft, but they both still exist, right? And are both a multi-billion dollar companies. Um, so number one, yeah, uh, companies don't fail because of competition, uh, competition, if anything, uh, is great for being able to create an industry almost together side by side. Right. So like I know most of my competitors, um, I'm kind of frenemies with them or whatever. It's funny. Um, but we, to be real, we, we kind of siphon off of each other's marketing efforts. And so like we kind of, uh, all, uh, benefit from being able to, uh, compete with each other. Um, what I will say though, is obviously you want to be the best. And so, uh, if you do have competition, you have someone there who you're like racing against. It's almost like um, you think about how different uh, distance runners uh, need other, like uh, when they're training, if, if, they're, if you're one of the fastest like marathon runners in the world, there's actually a team that's hired to run alongside you for certain portions of that marathon so that, I mean, not during the competition, but for training. Um, so while you're running your 26.2 miles or whatever, you have another person who's maybe running one or two miles as fast as they can and it's, it's mainly because you need someone to pace with you. Um, and there probably isn't someone as good as you, but like they kind of trade each individual person out beside you so that you're, you have someone to race alongside. So you can kind of know, how can I push myself a little further, a little further, a little further. Um, and then ultimately, like if you sort of figure out how uh, to uh, be the best at what you're doing, I mean, there are always competitors still right behind you, right? So um, it, it, makes your, it makes sure that you don't become complacent. Um, it makes sure that you do actually provide value to your users. Um, but ultimately you just need to sort of figure out how to, uh, survive as a company. And so, um, I think there are situations where companies like Facebook and Google and Apple or whatever, uh, they do try to, uh, kill your company if you are in a very, uh, unique and important space, right? There's articles about how Amazon would invest like a, maybe 500,000 or a million bucks in a startup because they're working in a very interesting space. And then Amazon would get a bunch of insider information and then create their own version and then just like. Uh, flood out that startup and just kind of kill them. And so obviously it's important to be very uh, sensitive and protective over your magic, your, your secret sauce or your magic um, or whatever it is that you have that makes you who you are um, as a successful company. But um, yeah, at the same time, it's just, I think overall competition is good. Um, but at the end of the day, you also do want to separate yourself uh, from other companies by being the best at what you do. So 
Yeah, yeah. And I think that that was my next follow up question for you, because there is a lot of competition and, and the big guys. Right. So if even like uh, I remember Halo Top, the ice cream, the uh, low calorie sugar ice cream, they came out. But then Kroger said, hey, we're going to do our own. So you, you brought up a good point and you answered it. But to follow up on that, what can you do when when the big dogs want to, you know, just say, hey, what if what if an Amazon says, hey, I want to take a merch like I'm going to do my own. Like, what, what do you do and how do you hedge yourself? The cool thing about uh, being a startup is. Uh, number one, it's not a nine to five job for you, right? So you are competing against a nine to five team at a large company. Yes, they have unlimited resources, but they also have people who are not going to work nearly as hard as you are. You are motivated by not having any income. And you're like, I got to figure out how to get my income going. And you just start sprinting. You start moving fast. And so start like, extremely um, effective startup teams. If you're able to hire or, or, or find the world's strongest team of like uh, five to 10 people, I mean, you will be way more effective than a team of 30 to 50 uh, Amazonians or whatever you want to call them, Googlers or whatever. Uh, and so ultimately like startups inherently have an advantage of moving fast uh, and being more effective. Um, and, and on top of that, there are, there is access to resources through venture capital firms or crowdfunding or whatever. So I wouldn't be too worried about the lack of resources. Um, I think that whenever, uh, for example, Facebook is working on a competitive product to immerse. I'm already aware of that. I already know that. Um, but the cool thing is uh, that's, it's exciting for us because we, that motivates us to, uh, try to be so impressive to the point where like they just cannot ignore us and then they reach out to us to partner with us which they just did and so although although that might be an, a way for them to try to get some insider information from us i'm very discerning as far as whether or not i'm sharing sensitive information or not with them um but at the end of the day if i can uh move so fast to the point where they just cannot respond quick enough it might just make more sense for them to acquire us as opposed to compete with us and so um at the end of the day uh you almost have to beat that threshold of uh, being worthy of competing against uh, and, and, and be so far past that where Facebook's just like, look, let's just acquire them. That's just better. And so uh, then from there, obviously, like you want to be wise about the way that you sell your company. You don't want, you don't want to just sell it to the first bidder. You want to have multiple bidders. So you, go to, you go to Microsoft, you go to Google, you go to Apple and see what they're willing to pay and ultimately go with the winning bidder. So Yeah. So essentially, that's great advice. Too big to ignore, right? Yeah. So college grads, a lot of college people watch this podcast. They listen to it in their car on the way to nine to five, whatever. What's your greatest advice to Gen Z's millennials and college graduates today? Ah, uh, man. You're, do you mean sort of in the uh, realm of startups or entrepreneurship or in what sort of realm? So we talked a lot about startups, but I mean in general, just in life, what is, what is the advice to a college grad? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say number one, at least uh, so I know there are some people who immediately jump ship to start a company. Uh, but you also, there's a lot that you're not really exposed to. There are some uh, people who kind of make mistakes along the way and figure it out. Um, but I think there's some value to getting a corporate job for at least a year or two and then jumping ship and starting your company. Because I think that there's a lot of processes in place that you're just not exposed to as a college graduate, right? Um, so I've had friends who would just jump ship uh, from, honestly, even just drop out from college and go straight to building a startup and not really know what business process really looks like unless they were um, already in a business degree and did case studies and like shadowed different businesses or whatever and had that sort of exposure. Um, if you haven't had that exposure, definitely get a job at a company, at least an internship at the very least, and then jump, jump ship and create your own thing so that when it's time for you to build your company, you're not totally lost. Um, there's plenty of uh, ways that companies um, operate that are effective. I'm not going to say that all corporations are a total waste of time. They, there's definitely value in learning how to work with a team, how to manage people, how to submit to a manager, uh, how to get certain uh, processes in place to make sure that you're effective and efficient uh, and actually getting hitting your goals and getting things done. So um, I would say don't just dismiss getting a job. Um, I would say at the very least get an internship just to be exposed to it and then you know start a company, et cetera, right? Um, I would also say, well, even taking a step back, um, if, I don't know, th th this one video changed my life. There's a video on YouTube if you just type in uh, like Steve Jobs, uh, life advice or something. Right. And he says something like, man, like life is too, uh, moldable for us to kind of ignore everything around us. Right. So like you, your parents kind of tell you, uh, just go get a nice paying job, kind of live inside your little box and, you know, don't bash into the walls too much. Um, but ultimately when you realize that you can build products that other people can use and you can build companies and these things are not, uh, just companies that God immediately just put down on earth and you just go there and collect a paycheck. Uh, people build these companies, right? Someone was the founder of this company. And so as you kind of grow things, realize that you can create a product that other people can consume and they will pay you money for it. And ultimately you can build your company to be like a Facebook or a Google or whatever, right? And so um, realize that 
uh, you can have that same impact, right? There are, yes, br brilliant people here on earth, but, uh, and, and people like Steve Jobs built you know, life changing, world changing companies. But at the end of the day, you're just as much human as Steve Jobs. And I think yeah, you can also figure this out too. Yeah. yeah, that's great. And what do you say to the naysayers though? I want to build a company. I want to do this, but you know, you got the haters in the background. What, how do you handle that? Uh, when you make it, you can just say they never loved you, man. <laughs> uh, when they try to, make it, say, yeah, yeah. Like, you never loved us. I'm just kidding. Yeah, uh, I know, right? <laughs> what I will say is, um, along the way, especially so, I'm a, I'm a solo founder for some context, um, and so it is very hard to be a solo founder, mainly because you don't have someone who's like in the trenches with you. Uh, I do have my larger team, so it's kind of like a founding team. They all have founder mentality, which is great. But at the end of the day, like I am still the founder and they look at me as the founder. Uh, and so they still feel that distinction and they still, they still feel like I'm their shield, right? Everything that we're facing, I'm the person who's just like getting beat in the face and my team mm -hmm. behind me kind of like, eh, we'll keep pushing you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, that's what I found up for, right? And so ultimately, like, I think that as we, um, yeah, continue building this company, like it is, I realize it's going to be difficult, man. And, and ultimately, like, there are going to be naysayers, um, your friends and family, even the people who you think that would support you the most, sometimes to start doubting it too. Uh, but at the end of the day, man, like, you just got to keep pressing on. And I think the one quality that makes uh, the strongest founders, it's not IQ, uh, it's not even just like, uh, how effective are you at working, but it's more so how much grit do you have, right? How much can you get beat up and still get back up, right? And so oftentimes, a lot of startups fail because people just give up. And I, and, and I wonder, man, how many more successful companies would be out there today if people just tried a little bit harder, right? So I talked to uh, one of the founders of Twitch, uh, you know, Twitch, the game streaming uh, company. Um, and so before he sold it to Amazon for like 970 mil a million bucks, something crazy, um, he told me that uh, most people who uh, build their companies, they kind of give up, like, like, like here, say this is the timeline to where they almost get some, some sort of inflection point in their growth but they kind of quit right here. It's like, man, if you just went a little bit further, you could have had this crazy success. And that's what happened to them. They, they first, they were called justin.tv. Uh, they were just like uh, paying themselves 20 K a year. You know, they all like four dudes lived in a studio apartment. <laughs> it kind of sucked, but they stuck it out for four years. And after four years, I mean, some people would have quit in year two or year three, but after four years, they finally figured out twitch.tv and then had crazy growth. And that's when Amazon uh, acquired them for nearly a billion dollars. So all that to say, they, the, the main quality they had was grit. And so, man, like the naysayers, I think, uh, help motivate you to uh, work even harder. Like, you know, I just want to prove you wrong sort of thing, especially if you have the right conviction. But at the same time, being sober-minded and not stubborn to realize that, hey, these things that they're poke, trying to poke holes through, let me just like assess that for myself. Is there any validity in what they're saying? If there's no validity, all right, keep, keep pushing, keep, keep, keep grinding, uh, uh, keep your grit intact. Um, but oftentimes there are also uh, entrepreneurs who are not willing to take any advice or are not willing to at least hear the naysayers out. And they're so blindsided and don't realize that there's a, uh, a landmine like five feet that way and they just run right through it and then self-destruct. So ultimately, yeah, um, use the naysayers as motivation, but also use them as potential uh, like blind spots, caller outers, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, so just, just have a very intellectually honest, sober-minded, objective, unbiased perspective on how you're building your company based on what other people are saying. It's, it's always good. Yeah. Um, so obviously take it all as one data point per individual, but if a lot of data points are telling you you're kind of on the wrong track, um, you might be building something like Airbnb where people are like, hey, like why would any stranger, why would I want a stranger sleeping on my couch or why or yeah. Uber, Uber, right? Like why would I want to pick up a stranger in my car? Why would I get one again in someone else's car? Um, but man, like they saw something that no one else saw. And although there are plenty of naysayers, there are actually a few people who are like, wow, I could actually see this happening. And likewise with the merch three years ago, I had nothing but naysayers. And now that COVID happened, I had like 50 texts from all these people saying, oh, now I get what you're working on. It makes so much sense. And so man, having that conviction, uh, assessing the data points and considering it. But then again, all the data points the past three years, um, I assessed it and I kind of, uh, took that into consideration, but at the end of the day, I still knew what I wanted to to get towards it yeah. and, and then now yeah. so. that was that was some great advice you motivated me that's like a master class on haters right there <laughs> that was good and i mean on that topic you look at 10 years ago if i don't know how true it is you might you might be able to shed some light but a hundred dollars in uber or something is like a million or so they said that if you invested in uber 10 years ago so things like that are it is crazy yeah so i mean even just thinking about man like i, I so, so the reason why a lot of dc firms are successful is because they just take like 
10 to 50, probably, probably 50 to 100K checks. And, and that's Trump change to them. That's like five bucks to them, right? Uh, Cause they're all millionaires and billionaires or whatever. And so they'll take like a 50 to 100K check and just sprinkle it across all random startups that are at least somewhat okay. And one of them will do crazy good. Um, and that, that'll pay for all the rest of the failures. So all that to say, like, it's kind of weird, but like, uh, it kind of sucks, but it takes money to make money. And so if you can figure out how to get your money into a company, like through a WeFunder or through Republic or something like that, obviously we went through WeFunder, so that's the one I'm going to push. Um, mm -hmm. ultimately, if you figure out how to get uh, at least a little bit of money into the top campaigns through WeFunder, um, I mean, you have a very, very good chance of that turning into a ton of, uh, money. Yeah. Return. I was investing in the stock market is uh like you know on average seven percent return per year or whatever so your hundred bucks will turn into a hundred and seven bucks but when you get into a startup as your startup valuation doubles and triples and quadruples and you know 100x and 200x that 100 bucks times 100x that 100 bucks turns into ten thousand dollars and so it's a very different world and that's why mainly we're in a world where the rich get richer uh is because mainly only vcs have the money or, or crazy and uh, millionaires are, already have the money to be able to invest in companies. Uh, the cool thing about crowdfunding is that sort of opens up the door for anyone to invest in any company at whatever yeah. level. You want. And so it's, 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 it's different in the fact that the stock market you cannot control. That's just, that's just known all like uh, controlling 5 billion, 7 billion emotions. I don't know how many people on the stock market, probably not 7 billion. There's not that many people who have access to the internet, but um, however, however, however many people on the stock market, you can't control their emotions. So it's going to be pretty difficult to know where it's going. Um, but when you invest in a startup, a lot of that startup's destiny is actually controlled by the founder and their team's ability to execute. And so if you put your money behind a person, a vision and a team, uh, based on awesome traction, based on a great product, uh, your dollar has a much, uh, higher chance of being returned 10 X, hundred X, 200 X, et cetera. So. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's the case with you guys. And it seems like that's something that can uh, happen. Yeah. So, uh, uh, as we conclude here, one question I like to ask is, do you, are you, are you scared of failure? I mean, I, I think I'd be lying to say no. I mean, I think anyone who says they're not, not scared of failure at all is, is, is uh, lying. Um, I would say for me, it's more so fear of wasting time. Like meaning I'm not, I'm, I'm not like afraid that like I'm going down the wrong path and like, it turns out all this is wasted. Like all this was like, like just like, just not the way to go. Um, my fear is that like at the end of the day, like I don't want to be, uh, 30, 40, 50 years old and not figured out at least some path towards, uh, being effective and successful. Right. Um, and so like, yeah, for me, like even there are times where even the past three years, I was like, man, the VR industry is taking forever to grow. Should I, should I just put, you know, drop this thing and move to the next thing and then come back to this maybe five years from now, 10 years from now when VR is uh, more, uh, more prominent. And, uh, yeah, I think for me, the biggest fear was that I was wasting time on the startup and you know, uh, by God's grace, we figured out, look, COVID hit and now things are really spiking. Facebook allocated another thousand employees over to the AR VR side of their company. And now they're just like really bolstering. If you saw all the leaks online of their new headset, stuff like that, they're really trying to bring out uh, someday glasses in the next couple of years. So all that to say, man, like, uh, I think it's important to fail fast. That's what, that's what I would say. Like figure out, like there's sort of this machine learning learning concept called, obviously I'm going to bring it back to that because it's my background, but there's this machine learning concept called hill climbing. And so the idea is, uh, say you have this mountain range, right? You have, you know, the Himalayas or whatever, and you're trying to find the peak of Mount Everest specifically, the highest peak out of all the peaks, right? So there's a ton that are down here and they're all very, very high mountains, but they're not Mount Everest. They're not the highest one. Um, but the idea is because it's so big, uh, you don't know which path to take to the freaking peak. Uh, and so you just start climbing somewhere. And, and so this idea of it, so the analogy is to start searching somewhere and eventually you get to a point where, all right, I hit like this local, local maxima. This is another peak. This is not Mount Everest, but I do want to go higher. So I have to come back down go to this other mountain and hopefully this one is uh, Mount Everest. So the idea is hopefully you can kind of find the peak of whatever you're searching for very quickly. Uh, so just sprint, man. I think the, the, the one thing that startups have um, that uh, large companies don't have ultimately is just speed and grit and the motivation to realize like, we don't have time, so we have to move fast. We don't have money in the bank, so we can't be complacent. So just sprint like crazy, fail fast to figure out what routes not to go, and eventually you'll be on a path towards success. And so um, the goal is to be hill jumping or mountain jumping in this case, to be eventually uh, in a position where you're just kind of like 
at the highest peak. Kind of a, another um, example of that is the inverse of that. There's, I forgot what it's called. There's this like game or something where, or almost like this physics experiment where uh, there's this board that has a bunch of holes in it. And one of the holes is more deep than the other holes. And ultimately, it, it, this is crazy. You should try this, I guess, or Google it or whatever. There's probably videos on YouTube. Um, ultimately, if you put a ball there, obviously it's easy for the ball to be in like a random local minima hole, like a one that's not the deepest hole. But what happens is uh, there's this thing called annealing, simulated annealing, where if you start off shaking it like crazy and then eventually slowing it down gradually, it eventually lands in the deepest hole. And so likewise, when you start, out, start, a, start a company, man, iterate like crazy, just rapidly, rapid fire every direction. And obviously have some sort of vision. Don't just be yeah. working on anything, but like have some sort of passion in a certain direction, but try everything down that path. And eventually you get to a point where your, your vision becomes more and more clear. You get more data and you're like, this is, this is the path we have to really, really go. And eventually you just commit. And so, yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. Commitment is huge. Thank you for that. I know people are going to appreciate hearing that. So, as we conclude here, I posted on my story recently asking what would people like to hear from a, a tech startup, you know, founder. And I, we had a great conversation. I won't have time to go through them, but I wrote one specifically because I thought it was very interesting. So is AI, is it going to take all our jobs, man? What's going to happen there? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I don't think so. So this might not be a popular opinion. And I think that, uh, I think it's important to uh, listen to a lot of other AI machine learning background people. Um, the perspective is, so, so think about this. So um, back when, like before factory jobs, right? Before there were machines that were building, uh, you know, the assembly line, for example, right? People were manually doing stuff, but then they just built machines that started doing some of that for them and automated a little bit more. And then the people became more creative and became the managers of those things, right? And they created more machines to be able to do their management job and then they would manage those managers or whatever, right? And so eventually gets to the point where the whole point of technology is to just automate the dumb stuff, the, the brainless, repetitive, whatever. Uh, even things like AI, that gets to the point where things become more and more brainless. If you think about uh, what was considered AI 15 years ago, um, like I'm trying to think of an example, like so uh, uh, there's, you know, IBM Watson solved chess or whatever, right? If you, if it, 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 technically in today's language, it's not considered AI, it's just considered very straightforward if then statements, if this, then this, if this, then this, et cetera. Um, but eventually you get to a point where uh, new technology comes out and it obliterates that machine that can do whatever, right? And so the point is, as better and better technology comes out, uh, older technology is no longer classified as AI, the new one is, and this becomes more, hey, that was just kind of dumb, automated, whatever. We, of course, we now know that this was kind of crappy technology. Um, but what's so crazy about the human brain is it's a lot more creative, right? It's able to learn things. Uh, if you think, I think Jeff Bezos talks about how the human brain is so data efficient, right? If you think about like Tesla's self-driving cars, they have to run through trillions of scenarios to make sure that their cars are the safest autopilot cars on the road. Whereas a human, when you learn how to drive, you're not driving a trillion hours. Like you drive like twice and you figure it out. It's because the human brain is extraordinary. Um, it's, it's different. It's different. Like there's a movie called Ex Machina where uh, this guy invents something called wetware. It's not software or hardware. It's like wetware. It's like kind of like a, a brain that kind of uh, has neurons that can kind of like uh, change and, 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 and evolve like the human brain does. And so if you think about like AI taking over the world, et cetera, AI, like Elon Musk, you probably heard, you heard uh, him say like, it's, it's, it's getting very, very like dangerous and it can't be very dangerous. And that's very true. It's just like how we created the uh, atom bomb or atomic bomb like a century ago, whatever, you know, like almost a century ago. Uh, and that's extremely dangerous. Yeah, it's great technology, or not great technology, but powerful technology, and it's very dangerous. Likewise, AI can be very dangerous, but it doesn't mean it's gonna take over the world and take over us. Um, ultimately, the whole point of AI and technology is just to automate the boring stuff so we can stay create, creative. And uh, I guess all that to say, like, once AI takes over more and more jobs, it's gonna create new jobs for us to be more creative, right? So for example, truck drivers uh, who currently drive manually on the road, once autopilot becomes popular, uh, people are saying, oh, it's gonna put truck drivers out of jobs. Like, no, that's not true. It's gonna create more truck driving supervising jobs, right? So like, maybe you're gonna sit in the back and say anything, if the, if the truck needs maintenance or whatever, uh, you're just there. If anything, you're collecting the paycheck and you're just chilling, you're eating your food while the truck is driving, right? So that's my perspective on AI. I don't think that uh, AI or technology in general uh, is bad for the world. Again, I don't think this is a zero sum game where, hey, either I have the job or the robot has the job. I think the robot does the job for you so that you can just sit back and chill. 
And so ultimately, and, and you can focus on things that you want to do. And that's why I love technology. Like I've been able to create different technologies that make my life a lot easier. I've made, I've made uh, an AI that automated half of my wife's job. She's an accountant. A lot of it is very manual, repetitive stuff. And I created this AI that would just do half her job for her. And she just got to sit back and chill for the other half. And so it was like, things yeah. like that is like, uh, it, it almost like enabled her to do, freed her up to do other stuff that the AI can't do. So yeah. all that, I wouldn't be so worried about AI taking over jobs. I think yeah. that um, it's so important for people, like this is directly related to the entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, a lot of people think, man, like, like, you know, people are taking over my jobs or like uh, these companies are shutting down. I no longer have a job. That's a very consumeristic mindset. Whereas entrepreneurs are more so like, how do I create jobs? And so you find technology to take over these boring jobs so that you can create new creative jobs. And so all that to say, man, I think technology is only helpful for our world. I think if anything, um, it doesn't create uh, wealth gaps. I think if anything, it, it almost evens the wealth gap, right? Thinking about how the internet has brought information uh, to way more people for way cheaper. If anything, it's democratized yeah. information, democratized access to resources, access to money. Um, if, if think about 50 years ago, you would not have been able to do any stock trading or any like Bitcoin mining or any of this type of stuff that as a kid, as a 14 year old kid, you have access to this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's, yeah. It's all yeah. I think Renji, that's an amazing perspective. I didn't even look at it like that. I think the audience will love to hear that because you know, a lot of people are scared, right? They're scared that, Oh, these jobs are going to be taken. So thank you for that. That's thanks for shedding light. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, you're not, you're more, you're on the robotic side and AI. So it's, this is just an interesting random question. You know, I'm looking today, there was Apple is 440. The NASDAQ is all time highs. Do you think we're in a tech bubble in terms of valuations? Uh, let's say, let's say, let's put it this way. There's a reason why I'm not investing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, to be real, I think there is, I think that there needs to be some kind of, uh, I think there is going to be an event that's going to just like pop this bubble and kind of even things out a little bit more. Um, people are talking about how, uh, so, so if you look at, you know, Apple was something like one and a half trillion, if not more in, in total market, um, what's the word, uh, market cap. And uh, Facebook is about 0.5 trillion. So like 500 billion, whatever, right? Uh, Facebook is working on something called Facebook OS. Um, that's public information. And like, as the next generation of headsets or whatever come out, uh, they want to have their own Facebook operating system, right? Similar to like how Windows and Mac have been the operating system for laptops, computers, and phones, right? And so when Facebook wants to be the operating system for the next computing platform, which is going to be glasses or whatever, um, that 0.5 trillion has way more room to grow than Apple's current 1.5 trillion. And so for me, I'd pro I'm not going to give people investing advice. Obviously, take yeah, yeah. Like, I would say Facebook's probably a better investment than Apple right now. I think there is probably going to be some sort of crazy burst. I think I as far as Tesla, for example, I think Tesla is going to continue growing, man. Like so many times, I had money in Tesla at 170, and I yeah. sold. I sold it at 260 <laughs> and that junk hit to like yeah. 200. I was like, man, yeah. I, could have, I, I would have been a millionaire right now. Like I would have, yeah. I would have, my money would have like 10 X. And so ultimately, man, I think that like, it, 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 you need to put your money behind the people who have repeated successes. And like, I don't think there's a cap on how big Apple or Amazon can, can become, but think about the fact that like, they just got called into court for being crazy monopolies that's going to have a direct impact on what sort of ways uh, Amazon and Apple and Microsoft and, uh, Facebook can execute. Um, yeah. Out of the four of them, though, Facebook is technically the smallest. And so if there's one of them you're going to bet on, there's way more room for growth for the smallest one, especially because they're the front runner for glasses, for example, right? So if anything, out of the four, if you're asking for my investment advice, I would say do more research on Facebook. I think there's more room to grow. Um, Apple is risky. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. And just an FYI for the audience, none of us are giving investment advice it's to their own discretion. They got to contact their own advisors. Oh. But you're, you're bringing back uh, bad memories for me. I, I had a different story. I bought Tesla at 195, ended oh. up selling it at 180. So to see that, you know, we both could have been millionaires off. It's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, and that's the thing, man, again, put your money behind the people who have repeat successes, man, like they're yeah. doing something different. And Elon Musk is one of those people. man. So I'm not saying go buy Tesla right now. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, so you might buy it and then it might plummet and, and you know, it sucks. Um, but ultimately like do your research, look for yeah. uh, the founders who know what they're doing. I mean, I'll be real. Tim Cook is not the founder of Apple. Um, and things have not been the same since Steve Jobs, you know, unfortunately passed away. And so, um, but Mark Zuckerberg is still at Facebook. Elon Musk is still at Tesla. Jeff Bezos is still at, at Amazon. So, you know, do your homework yeah. and know where you want to be. Yeah. That's awesome. An interesting founder that I've been listening to recently is the Nicola uh, Motors CEO and founder. He's an interesting guy. I, don't know I if haven't got done to see him. research on that just yet. Yeah. Well, and then lastly, 
where can people find you, Renji, on social media? Where can they find the merch? Just give us all the links. I'm going to post everything in the links uh, in the podcast, but just give us, you know. Yeah, so uh, on Twitter, uh, my name is Renji.Dejoy. Uh, Instagram, I believe I'm also the same, Renji. I'm oh, sorry, Twitter is Renji Bajoy. Instagram is Renji Um uh, Yeah, it would be helpful if you posted the links. But as far as Immersed, you can go to our website, immersedvr.com. Um, there's also our Twitter, uh, at immersedvr. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, we're, we're obviously like wanting to continually uh, push out content to Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Um, for us as a company, like I think that uh, as we do build the future of work, we would love for you to be along for the ride and kind of uh, stay uh, in the loop because uh, this type of stuff is how you figure out how to be successful in life. Like learning about other people's stories, uh, learning from our failures and ultimately standing on the shoulders of giants and being able to uh, achieve your own success from the learnings of other people's failures. So um, we'd love for you to follow along our, uh, our story, our progress. Uh, we're constantly posting. So uh, definitely follow us. Yeah. And I'm putting this out for you now for law of attraction, but I'd love to eventually bring you back for another episode, whether it's next year or five years after an acquisition or an IPO or something. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I'd love to do that. This is great. Yeah. So, and lastly, what's your daily success routine look like? Daily success routine. Um, so my, fa I, I, every day is not the same, but uh, the days that I play basketball in the mornings definitely has been very effective. Um, the days I don't play basketball in the morning because, you know, it just sort of jump starts my brain and just gets me moving. Um, the days I don't play basketball in the morning, I uh, work out midday around lunch. Um, again, it is different for every person. For me, I tried to work out super early in the morning uh, to jumpstart my brain, but right around lunchtime, I'd have a huge big food belly and would be like half asleep. Um, yeah. So I no longer wake up at 4 or 5 a.m. anymore. Instead, I wake up more around probably 6 30 ish. Um, definitely like getting up early. Like I realized most of the stuff I do around like 9 30 to like midnight probably not as productive as I would be if I were to wake up early. So I decided to kind of try to go to bed early. Um, more recently, that hasn't been the case because uh, we had just had this Oculus store launch. So I've been up coding to like 1.30 a.m. every morning and waking up at 5.30 or 6 anyway. Uh, so my sleep's kind of sucked. But I will say my biggest life hack for uh, sort of like a, an all-star routine sort of thing, I would say definitely work out midday because it kind of uh, like re it gives you like a checkpoint and kind of like a a second to kind of like clear your mind halfway through the day and sort of jumpstart you to keep going sprinting the rest of the day. Um, and yeah, I think that like the weekends, so people ask me, do you like just disconnect on the weekends or whatever? Um, I'm different in the fact that I do more of a daily recharge. So whenever like eight o'clock uh, at night rolls around, I'll watch like an episode of the office just to like, you know, laugh my butt off and just like kind of <laughs> a little bit. Um, and then I might get back on to kind of code a little bit and then go to bed. Um, but I think for me personally, a daily recharge works better than a weekly recharge. Some people, they just kind of grind throughout the week and on the weekends they disconnect. But for me, I realized that that actually makes it more difficult for me to come back to work on Monday. And so for me, I kind of, I'm not saying I work seven days a week. I think Sundays I just take off altogether. I might do a little bit, maybe check email, or whatever. Um, Friday, Saturdays I hang out with people, check email, whatever, but I don't totally disconnect. And, and for me, dude, like I have a job that I love, so it's easier to not disconnect. Some people are like, man, why do you work so much? Like, uh, this is not healthy for you, blah, blah. And I'm like, man, I'll, I'll be real. If I wasn't working as much, if I wasn't as in tune with my startup, I'd probably be more worried whenever I'm away from my startup that I'm like anxious and long, as opposed to just like being part of it. Like I love it. I enjoy it. And like my team, we have such a great culture. Um, for us, when we work, it doesn't feel like work. And I think that people who have a different pers perspective on work and they see it as a burden, let them have their perspective. If you love what you do for a living, I think there's nothing wrong with you kind of just like checking in on the weekends or whatever. Um, but ultimately like at the same time, obviously take maybe at least, at least two weeks a year to kind of just completely disconnect. Um, but yeah, the biggest life hack again, in two, in two words or one sentence is uh, midday workout and then end of the day recharge or unwind. I would say like watch the office, watch space force or whatever Steve Carell's new thing is mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it helps to kind of uh, a, a couple of hours to kind of decompress. So yeah. I love that. That's a great life hack. And I'm sure the audience will appreciate that too. Thank you for that advice. So once again, everybody, that is Renji Bajoy, who is the founder and CEO of Immersed. These guys are next up, man. You guys got to tune in, follow Immersed. I think this is going to be revolutionary and we're excited to see what you guys do next. Thank you for your time, Renji. Thank you for having me.